Boys and girls, what up? It is your boy BQ, and I am back. Been back from the honeymoon for about a week now. Uh, for most of you know that I wasn't going to review last week's episode due to being out of town. So I am back. I've been back for a little bit. Um, I, I did one upload on the channel, but honestly, I've kind of enjoyed not talking about wrestling for a little bit. So I didn't really jump into things right away. Uh, but we're going to get into this episode, obviously. I want to say thank you to everyone who who gave me well wishes uh, for the honeymoon. I got married in October, but October, obviously, not the best weather in the world across the United States, across the world, whatever. Um, it, it The kids are in school. You feel me? So it would just made sense for us to push our honeymoon. We were able to do a five-day cruise, Gulf of Mexico. So it was great. And it, it um, I don't. I can't tell you the last time that I've just been able to have several days in a row without responsibility. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's been, I've gone on vacation, you know, but most of the time, all of the time, my kids are with me. Uh, so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. Uh, being an owner of many, many pets, you know, there's always that kind of fresh, that, that, uh, stress about how they're doing back in the States or, uh, back in Nevada or whatever it is. I shouldn't say the states. We haven't left the country. Um, uh, I just haven't had this opportunity to just kind of chill before. I've been a custodial parent for many, many moons. Uh, many years, I was a single parent, like 100% single. It's me and my three kids. And, you know, with that comes a lot of responsibility because a lot of dudes at my age, you know, I guess I was in my mid thirties at the time. Um, a lot of guys don't, aren't put in that scenario, you know, and now I know how to cook. <laughs> I'm pretty decent now, but at the time I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I had three mouths I needed to feed every single day. Um, and it was very stressful for, for me because my kids were obviously much younger <laughs> at one point. And when you're going to work every day and you're sitting here and you're stressing about them back home and, you know, I didn't really have a lot of help for a very, very long time. So um, I just haven't had many opportunities where I can just not worry about dinner because I still cook in the house. I love my wife more than everything, more than anything. Um, I cook. So it doesn't matter how long my day is, how many hours I worked. I could work a 12 hour shift, whatever I cook. So um, to just have a week where I, I don't have to worry about cooking, I don't really have to worry about my pets. You know, I'm checking on them, but I don't have to really worry on worry about them not so worried about the kids I'm checking on them, but you know, to give some context as well, I work till 8 AM every day. I sleep from about 9 30 AM. I'm sorry, about 9 AM to 10 30 AM. And then I'm up the entire day. And then I go back to sleep at 7 30 PM to 10 30 PM. So I have an hour and a half nap in the morning and a three hour nap at night. So I don't actually sleep. I nap. So, um, kind of gives you some context of, <laughs> How, how my days kind of go to where, um, you know, we're able to go on a cruise and I'm just, I can just sleep. I can just like sleep for eight hours. You know, that's not usually a thing with me. So it was nice. So everyone, you know, thank to everyone, thanks to everyone for the well wishes and all that. Um, of course, glad to be home as well. So let's talk some impact. I'm glad I didn't review last week's show because I didn't really care for it. I did watch it. Um, my the biggest disappointment to me was the return of the piss yellow filter. And the show was looking so good for a while. Cameras were fairly white balanced. They weren't messing with the levels, the color levels too much. It looked good. And now you were in Montreal, the best looking crowd they've had in a decade, over a decade. And it's the piss yellow filter. This particular episode was not as bad as the first one. And what was asked backwards is that last week's episode, the backstage stuff with Gia Miller, I thought looked excellent. And I, that's been the thing all year that I said, this looks like shit. It looked excellent. And then this episode, it goes back to not looking again, good again. So I'm, as I'm always saying, you cannot have two episodes in a row that look good. I don't know. I, or they look the same. It, it changes week to week. So we, we definitely had a step back in production quality. Hopefully when they get to Tampa or whatever it is, wherever it is they are filming, 
uh, that we can kind of get back to normal because we were going a very, very good direction, very positive direction. And now we have taken steps backwards for whatever reason. So this actual episode, um, you know, I, I always point out Tom Hannafin yelling at us and all that shit in the beginning. I was watching a WWE match this morning. Just just one I had interest from, from several years ago. I just had some interest in it. It popped in my head. And it's like, I kind of want to watch this. There's a play-by-play announcer in this match. Sounds great. Great voice. Great delivery. Natural. I said, man, who's this? It was fucking Tom Hannafin. Sounding nothing like he is on TNA. You know, here it's like, oh, person, y'all, and I'm like, dude, he wasn't talking like that in WWE. I don't, that, that it was like so shocking to me that he was just kind of speaking in his natural voice, which is a little more of a radio voice. He was reacting to things in a very natural manner. And then we get like this, like fucking fake, fucking phony shit on TNA. And I mean, I said the same thing about Striker and D'Lo, they're phony. I'm like, is that just how you call TNA wrestling? Is it impossible to to do the play by play in any other voice, any other manner? Like, can you not? Is it because you're in a smaller, confined um, area with with less people that you just cannot naturally react to stuff the same way because you don't have the large crowds? Like, I was freaking shocked that it was him. I could not believe it. Oh my lord, people. Let's get to the actual wrestling here. The actual show for August 1st, 2024. It kicked off with the Rascals versus Trent. I will have a number seven with a Coke. Make it an extra large. Cheeseball Mike Bailey and Kushida. Normally, this type of match, I wouldn't have a lot of interest in. Obviously, it was very good. The people were very, int- uh, I mean, the, the, the people in the stands in the arena were very into this, very interested in it. I'm sure the people at home were very, very entertained. It was great wrestling. It was a fun match. The reason I say I normally wouldn't care about something like this is because there's a few categories where I don't care when I'm watching a match. If it's, I don't care who the victor is, you know, if I'm just watching and I don't care who win or lo- wins or loses, which this fell into that category. Uh, one where I already know who's going to win, and it's, but it's going to go long. Like Mike Santana, I knew he was going to beat Campaign Singh, but I also knew it wasn't going to go long. You know what I'm saying? Um, and matches that don't advance storylines, that we're just wrestling for the fucking sake of wrestling. You, you know what I'm saying? So this kind of would have fell into that category where I don't care who wins, so I'm not really into it. But... Um, I was I was interested in it because of the versions of the the version of the Rascals. This is going to be the last Wesley appearance, if or at least not for a very long time. This version of the Rascals. This is not something we see every day, so I had some interest in it for that reason. But the match was very good, very fun, great way to open up a show, and shows should open up with this kind of energy. If you haven't heard the Rascals theme song in person. It freaking slaps like it. You can feel the bass. You can feel the kicks. You can hear the lyrics crystal clear. You know who's coming out right away. There's a genuine reaction from the people and it gets you pumped. So um, it's a it's a good way to start off the show. I still laugh at these guys being white meat baby faces just out of the fucking blue. Um, obviously, the Rascals win this thing. I knew I knew they were going to win and I didn't really care who won, like I said, so. Um, sorry, I'm actually scrolling on the website for the uh, the uh, results because my notes were extremely messy this week. Jordan Grace that has she has a little talking segment. Uh, she praises Ash by elegance. As I said at Slam Anniversary, that was my favorite match. I wasn't expecting it to be, but it was by far my favorite favorite match on the show. Jordan Grace is back with another open challenge i feel like i say this every week and it's because i do she is just wrestling people 
I do think that she is the best knockout in the history of TNA. Saw a post on Facebook the other day saying, who's your Mount Rushmore? Who's your number three? And it wasn't Mount Rushmore. It said, who's your number three? Gail Kim's obviously number one. Awesome Kong is number two. Who's your number three? People are like, oh, Mickey James, Angelina Lutt. Jordan Grace is above all them. She's above Gail Kim. If you don't agree with that, you don't have to. That's my personal opinion. That Jordan Grace is is number one. She is not number three to me. She's not number four. Is she the best knockouts champion ever, though? No. Because I was comparing her to Deanna Perrazzo not long ago. Deanna Perrazzo had great matches, but we were also pretty invested in the storyline, and we were invested in, is Deanna going to lose this match? You know what I mean? We're, we're invested in, is this the person to beat Deanna? Just wrestling for the sake of wrestling. Jordan is just wrestling. Which actually has me thinking, because I've been saying that I think Giselle Shaw is going to challenge her bound for glory, and, and Jordan will put her over. The more that she's doing these open challenges, kind of makes me think maybe she's just going to do an open challenge bound for glory. And um, that might be that that Tessa Blanchard return that people are you know talking about. It's got to be a it's got to be someone. You know what I mean? It's got to be someone new that can uh, take the mantle. So uh, right now I'm kind of split. I don't know if it's going to be uh, Giselle winning the belt or another open challenge. I'm under the impression this open challenge here is not good. It just, it's nothing to write home about. So they probably didn't need to do this. They probably just could have amount, announced the match normal. You know what I'm saying? But she's just defending the title to fucking defend it. And there's no, there's no need for it. It's like completely unnecessary. Like she doesn't have to defend the title, but they're just like, hey, let's just have Jordan wrestle on the show because she's one of the most over, one of the most popular people. But there's got to be a, there's got to be another way. I was into the match with her and Eric Young versus Ash by Elegance and Hammerstone. I was into that. I like mixed tag matches. That's like a creative way to get her on the show without having to wrestle some jabron defending her title. You feel me? But uh, we're on the road to emergence, and she hasn't had a meaningful title match in, in 2024. Not not a single one. Don't tell me it was. Well, no, we'll throw, we'll say Ash by Elegance was, even though I wasn't a big fan of the build. But don't tell me Steph Delander was a meaningful match. Even if you want to say Steph Delander and Ash by Elegance were meaningful, there's nothing, nothing on top of that. It's been, we are in August and it's fucking fluff the entire year. Um, Man, speaking of Ash by Elegance, the real winner, at Slammiversary was her titties because they didn't pop out of that top. We we're going to see Ash by Elegance's titties one day in a wrestling ring because she is, they're barely, barely holding on with this, this top and she's constantly tucking them back in when she's wrestling. So um, we will see nip at one point. I don't know when, I don't know versus who, uh, but it will happen. So yeah, Jordan grace next week. Yay. Open challenge. Open challenges in TNA just never. <laughs> I can't believe I was actually very embarrassed that I that I predicted uh, for her open challenge the other day, uh, the other month on TNA plus that I actually predicted Natty Neidhart. I'm very embarrassed to myself. That was a real Mark fantasy booking type of. Thing. Um, I should have known <laughs> that it was going to be nothing like these all are. Jim Miller interviews Campaign Singh, uh, looking for an update on Mustafa Ali backstage. Uh, there was some phony acting here. Uh, Campaign Singh pretending he's on the phone. Sam, fortunately, he's a good actor, but it was when I say phony, it was just like he wasn't talking to anybody, you know, because no one talks like that. But he's actually a, a pretty good actor, and I'm I, I'm really growing on him, or he's growing on me, I should say. So I'm very disappointed that we're not getting more legs out of Ali and Singh as a as a team. 
but uh, Singh is randomly telling him, or excuse me, Mustafa Ali is randomly telling him that he needs to pr pr prove his loyalty. I'm stuttering this morning. I'm sorry. Uh, prove his loyalty. And I don't even know what that's about. I don't, maybe I missed something. I don't, I don't understand. Then we get Rosemary in action. I thought this was, uh, she, she's wrestling a, a enhancement talent. I thought it went a little long. Her name was Kristara. She should have got no offense in. I thought, I thought it went um, a minute or two too long. But I love the new look. I love the new music. It was very much time to get her away from the decay theme. I think it is a good theme. But Rosemary is, I mean, st stale is not the right word. But they just haven't captured the magic that she once had. She's always going to be over. But there was something magical about her at one point, and they, they've just lost that. So um, they, I don't know. It was somewhere between her doing heel comedy and uh, trying to have sex with Johnny Bravo, um, trying to rehash a couple different versions of Decay that just didn't work. You know, so she needed this. She really, really needed this. Her finisher, this as above, so below, I don't like. She's been using it for a while. I really liked when she used the Red Wedding. Uh, she has stopped using that so that we can see Jody Threat's worst version of it. Um, Tom Hannafin was running down the, the matches at the top of the show, and he's like, Asha Slamovich versus Jody Threat. I don't think, was that this match, this episode? It was. I was trying to think if it was last week's or not. Jody Threat. I'm like, why is he why is he putting emphasis on her name like that? Um, last week when Ash was wrestling in the tag team match with Hammerstone, my disappointment in Ash was that it was comedy again. It was like she just lost the knockouts title match and it's comedy and it's still the personal concierge announcing her to the ring like nothing happens, and then as soon as the match starts, he's he's looking behind him for Rosemary. He wasn't scared when they entered the ring. So, you know, this this gimmick still isn't still is not quite hitting for me, but the uh the Rosemary match. Just just new, you know, again, new music, no new look, new feel, new mission statement, even though we don't know what the mission statement is because everything she says makes no sense, but you know, I'm just into it, and it's going to be nice to see this uh, a different type of feud for Ash by Elegance here. It, there's probably going to be a lot of comedy involved on her end, which I'm not looking forward to, but just to get her out of the knockouts title picture for a little bit, because even though she wasn't wrestling for the title, she was always there, you know, she was in the matches. So this is just something a little different for her, so um, I'm looking forward to that. They gave us an uh, emergence commercial, and uh, Tom Haddifin said, get your tickets now! If you don't speak Hannafin, he was saying, get your tickets now. System had a promo backstage calling themselves the Dream Team. They did this promo last week, but no one wanted to speak. Why is JDC, is that his name? Johnny Dango Curtis, JDC. Why is he with him, but Masha Slamovich is not? I don't, like, he's not a part of the system, so you might as well throw her ass in there, too. But anyway, last week they didn't want to speak because they all lost their titles. And uh, this week they kind of did. They were like, "Hey, let's get back. Let's get back on track." Alicia changed her dress real quick. They're standing in the same exact place. Um, <laughs> they just they just recut the promo. Um, Mike Santana addressed the system. So I, I do got to give some respect here. They were able to build this Moose Mike Santana storyline. I thought they were being really really obvious that Moose. You know, and I said I was very wrong about this. About how the way the Slam Reversary main event played out. Moose, I thought, was guaranteed to win. I thought he telegraphed that he was going to win and that he was going to defend the title against Mike Santana. That didn't happen. He loses his belt. He is going to wrestle Mike Santana, but now they have a feud that has nothing to do with the title. It's actually kind of genius the way they put that together. Or genius might be a strong word, but they don't usually do that. They don't... They don't build a, a feud based on the storyline prior to the champion losing his title, you know? So I have a lot of interest in Mike Santana versus Moose. I love two guys with size who can work. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Campaign Singh, while he was 
calling out the system, challenged Mike Santana to a match. And we got that match. Did we get it next? We didn't get it next. Josh Alexander came out. Um, well, he refused it. So was it man, it's hard because I watched two episodes in a row. Was it last week that he refused to speak? By the way, if I have to hear na 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 goodbye again, I may throw myself out the window. I think it's like four or five times in the last two weeks. I hate that song anyway. Um, but yeah, Josh and Alexander's music played. He refused to go out to the stage or to the ring, I should say. GM Miller found him backstage and questioned him. And Josh is saying he doesn't owe anyone an explanation. and doesn't care anyone's opinion. I think Josh sounds great here. I think people forget he was a heel for a very long time in Impact. So this is natural to him. This was This isn't like, oh, let's see if he can be a heel. He's been a heel. He just hasn't been a heel by himself. So I'm really looking forward to this. Finally change that music. Finally. It is more the music of a star. It's more, it has some energy to it. So I'm excited about this version of Josh Alexander. I'm very excited for it. Then we got Frankie Kazarian versus Ryan Nemeth. I think Ryan Nemeth is pretty decent in the ring. I, I, he can't talk. He's got a very annoying uh, nasally voice. But I think he's okay. I think he's all right in the ring. And I know uh, Mike Gilbert really does not like him and think he sucks. I don't think he sucks. You know, I, I think he's okay. He doesn't he doesn't bother me at all. But I thought this was a a fun little match. It, it is what it was. We knew Frankie Kazarian was going to win, but um, I thought I thought it was fine. Josh Alexander comes down to the ring after hits Ryan Nemeth with a C four spike. So if we rewind. Frankie Kazarian is, again, like semi-berating Josh Alexander's wife, telling her to announce him as the king of... He's being a bully. Announce him as the king of TNA and all this shit. Josh Alexander comes down to the ring after this and, and just looks at Frankie Kazarian and no, no problem with, with Frankie talking to his wife like that. Ryan Nemeth, though, that's who he's got the problem with. I guarantee... Before next week's episode, we're going to get Tom Hannafin. Say for Spike. Arr. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about with the R, just listen to any match that he calls. And at some point, Arr. that shit does not fail. We're getting the return of Ultimate Exit Emergence. I don't know why. I've said this before. I don't know why they call it the return. We get it several times every year. You know, it's not the return of six sides of steel. You know, we, we get we get we get this like at least twice a year, but they always call it return like like we like it's uh, nostalgic, like we ain't seen it in 10 years. Then we got Jody Threat, Jody Threat versus Masha Slamovich. This match was fine for what it was. They were showing highlights of blood sport. Where Masha beat Jody Threat, Jobby Threat. The production quality was better than what we saw in TNA. They had the two shows side to side on the show. The production, it looked better than the show we were watching. I thought that was absolutely embarrassing. I don't know. This is the few that will never die because they don't have any tag teams. Because the, the system cheated at Slammiversary, they got to now find a way to, to get Jobby Threat and Danny Luza to wrestle for the belts again so that they can win the belts. That is exactly what's going to happen here. And that's probably how they're going to finally break up Masha and Alicia. It is not Militia's fault that the goof ref took like 45 seconds to get the singular title belt out of the ring. That, that's on the ref. You know what I'm saying? If they had time to hang up a belt and use it to win the match, that is the referee's fault. It took him a good like 45 seconds to give someone instructions. He goes to the far side of the ring instead of just where the belts were, which is immediately to his left. Instead, he goes to the far side and pull, calls some random person over, the timekeeper, given, I mean, 
the directions he was giving it was like he was reading a book Ch- chapter one of you know like what what the hell jody threat has no business beating masha slamovich i don't care if she cheats i don't care what she does she has no business beating masha slamovich none but they have to find a way to continue this feud, which should be done, which should be over with. Nobody wanted to see the rematch to begin with, the contractually obligated rematch. Where's Laredo Kid's rematch, Tom Hannafin? Where is Mustafa Ali's rematch for the X Division Championship? Tom. So yeah, Jody Threat, no, no business winning. Then we hear from Joe Hendry. I, I think it was good to keep him off the show this week. You know, we can't just throw him on every. I understand he's popular, but same with Jordan. Like sometimes just have him talk. So I, I thought this was fine for what it was. I'm still not convinced that Joe Hendry is not a flash in the pan. So I hope that they can prove me otherwise. And what I've explained to everybody is that him being over has nothing to do with what he has done on on screen. It's what he did out of the ring. So that is my concern is that um, creatively they're not going to be able to make like if he wins the title at some point, people might want him to drop the title like a month later. You, you know what I'm saying? It might just be one of those things where he it's a great chase. And then when he's a champion, you're like, oh, I, I don't know if this works. You know what I mean? But they got they got time. They're not rushing anything with Joe Hendry. They're not putting the belt on him right away. I've had this theory. And I feel very good about this theory. I have some hot takes, folks. I, I, I know that I do. I have some very hot takes, and I'm wrong 90% of the time when I make predictions. I, I'm very confident in saying that when Nick, Nick Nemeth signed on to TNA, that he was promised the title by Slammiversary. Because when you're competing against the AEWs and, and New Japan dates and all that, like you right, does that make sense that you, you have to make some kind of Hey, come here. We're going to pay you this, but we're also guarantee a world title run because the AEW wouldn't have been able to do that. We guarantee you be the world champion. So what I think what happened was they had to put the belt on him at Slammiversary. Even though everything happened with Joe Hendry, they had to put the title on him. And that's why it was kind of so random. It was so le- out of left field. No one expected that. People were either either Moose is going to retain or Joe Hendry is going to win. That's the way everybody looked at it. But I, I think their hands were tied. I think they, they had to put the belt on Nick Nemeth because when else are you going to do it? Because let's go back to the history of TNA. You can go back as far as you want. History says that Nick Nemeth is going to win the world title at some point, right? Probably sooner than later. I think I'm I'm shocked he didn't win it already. But history says he's going to win it at some point. This was the only chance to do it. You you can't stretch it out to Slam Anniversary. I mean, the, excuse me, to Bound for Glory. Now people are really pissed off because they're like, "Yo, what, when's Joe Hendry going to get his moment?" You know, this this is the only time you could have done it. That's why when when you know Josh Alexander turned heel, people are like, "Well, why didn't Josh win the title?" Because that would have been that would have made sense, right? You do the heel turn that leads to the title victory, and then you go you start building Joe versus Josh at Bound for Glory. That makes sense, right? Nick Nemeth winning made no sense, and that's truly what I feel is ha- feel happened. They were able to get Joe Hendry over in the sixth way by having him pin Moose. You know what I mean? Like they were able to make that adjustment but they couldn't change the finish of the match. And I think even though the match played out much better than any of us expected, because there's different storylines, I think it is exact was, ex- I think it was supposed to be exactly what it looked like, which was six random content wrestling to get as many people on the, sh- on the card as possible. And Nick Nemeth getting his feel good moment. Like, I think that's what it was supposed to be. They just so happened to be able to luck into the storyline with Joe Hendry they're able to turn Josh Alexander in the process. You know what I'm saying? So there, there were some things that they were able to do in the within the match, but I do think that they promised Nick Nemeth the title. 
And I'm worried about Nick Nemeth as champion because the minute someone comes out and cuts a promo, I'm going to be a fighting champion. That means we're going to get a bland baby face title run where they're just having random matches every week. And that is, that is an excuse for, uh, we don't want to write any stories for this person. So they're just going to be a fighting champion and they're just going to wrestle people, you know? So I'm not really looking forward to this Nemeth title run. If I'm being totally honest with you. Campaign Singh took on Mike Santana. Campaign Singh got the jobber entrance, and he lost like a jobber as well. So Mike Santana, Mike Santana wins. He cuts a promo. The promos for these two episodes, the wrestlers were turning their back to the camera entirely too much. I don't know if there was no people on the on the uh, hard cam side, but everyone kept turning around like they used to do in the in, or in Orlando. Now, AEW, we know, has nobody on that fucking side, right? On the hard cam. But the wrestlers do a pretty good job of making you feel that there's they're talking to a crowd in front of them. These two episodes, everyone keeps turning around. Mike Santana did it. Uh, Nick Nemeth did it. Uh, last week, um, Mustafa Ali did it. Yeah, I'm trying to think if anyone else got promos, but everyone was talking uh, to the crowd. What do we get after this? Sorry, like I said, I got to scroll on the website. So we got Nick Nemeth versus Mustafa Ali after this. I'm go- I'm not going to bullshit you guys. I didn't watch the match because what a- I'll watch it at some point. But what would I say any different if I watched the match compared to if I didn't watch the match? They had a good match. They had a long match. We know who was going to win. We know Nick Nemeth was going to win. It didn't advance anything. He's just being a fighting champion. So if you like great wrestling, this is a match for you. 100%. I will watch it at some point. I didn't care to watch it within the context of getting ready to do this review. I just didn't care. Um, Because I knew Nick Nemeth was going to win. I knew it was just going to be a long match. When Mustafa Ali came out and challenged them, I knew he was done. Because that is also a TNA thing was... Someone's in WWE, they're, they, you know, they don't lose to anybody. They finally lose, and then it, let's squeeze a world title match out of them real quick before they exit. I knew exactly what it was, so I knew Nick was going to win. Um, saying I don't care is probably strong. I just didn't care in the moment. I will watch this match at some point just because I know it's good. But uh, w- with knowing who was going to win and knowing that it was probably going to have more time than I wanted to invest in it, I just didn't watch it at the time. Because as I said, what am I going to say any different? Good match, long match. Nick Nemeth wins with the danger zone. You know what I'm saying? I would have said the same exact thing if I watched the match. And then uh, the wedding. The wedding of Steph DeLander and PCO. What a fucking sham of a wedding. Um. I'm not going to say that I wasn't entertained with this because it was entertaining. But it was just so thrown together, this whole thing. I mean, what has happened in the last five weeks? Um, PCO asks her on a date. They go on a date in the ring with theme songs and commentary. Uh, Steph Delander goes through a table. She's in a coma for a week. And then she wakes up and then she goes to Australia saying, I got to tie up loose ends. Will will you wait for me? She's gone for 10 days. Um, That's not really a trip. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you, if I go to Australia, I'm going there for like a month. Um, Can you wait 10 days for me? PCO. I think I've gone longer than that without seeing my wife. I mean, my God. And then they come back. There's an immediate proposal. And then, a wedding two weeks later. We've had wrestling weddings over the year, over the years. The most memorable TNA one, obviously, is Braxton Sutter and Laurel Van Ness. It had an engaging storyline. It was very well thought out, very well put together, very entertaining. This was not that. This was just very, very thrown together because they wanted to do it in Montreal. Um, So there's really no story here. They're just disrespecting the sanctity of marriage by just getting together. They haven't Seth Delander didn't even test drive the car. 
and she's gonna she's gonna marry this dude you know so again I, i'm not gonna say i wasn't entertained by it i didn't think it was bad television next necessarily but i didn't think it was really really good television rhino comes down i mean they didn't even try the set looked like shit rhino comes down with a tie they're being married by santino who's in a t-shirt and his badge and it's comedy he's talking about his 12.99 license like man i, I would have lost my shit if my wedding was a joke you know what i mean and it could have been my brother-in-law married us he's a pastor and he he cracked some jokes you know what i'm saying but it was still it was still respectful to what you know to, to to my wedding and my vows and all that you know what i mean like this was just a complete joke everyone come down with, with entrances but um it was just thrown together that's all i'm saying i'm not saying it was necessarily bad 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 it was just very very thrown together and they actually did get married they they completed the ceremony uh, steph lander put the ring on pco's right hand I'm not going to give her shit for that because I did that to my wife at my wedding. I corrected myself, but I did try to put it on the right hand. Uh, but yeah, she definitely put it on the right hand and she thought about it too. I'm not going to get into too much more of this. I, I thought the, the ring being on the dead grandmother's hand was very, or finger still was very funny. I thought that was a very good, just, Tongue in cheek type type of joke that fit, you know, PCO's gimmick. I I that got a pop out of me. I mean, that looked like a legitimate dying finger. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they they exchange the vows. It's all comedy. This whole thing is comedy. Uh, and then it, it was funny because he goes, "You can French kiss the bride." And then he's you see Santino Santino looking towards the entrance because he knows Cardona's supposed to come. And then finally is the always oh, ready. And that that is the song of a star. Um, I brought up, I, will, I was reviewing NWA a couple months ago when it was Matt Cardona versus EC3. And that always, always ready song hits and the crowd is just jamming to it, man. I mean, they're popping, they're going crazy. And then EC3 song plays and it's majestic and it's slow it's kind of josh alexander and all of a sudden the crowd completely dies and that was your world champion you know so i say there's there's just something to having the theme song of a star but he comes down has a gift the cinder block he takes out pco and he gives an elbow to santino rhino leaves the ring rhino does not stand up for pco doesn't try he does not attempt to stop this he does an attempt to take a shot at Matt Cardona. He just gets out of the ring like a coward. I'm going to assume it's not storyline, and I'm going to assume that Cardona missed the step. That Cardona was supposed to take out Rhino as well and forgot because there was no reason for him to just get out of the ring. I mean, uh, Zaya Brookside put up more of a fight because. Uh, Rewinding a little bit, when he asks, you know, does anyone object? Here comes first class. Zaya Brookside put a put up more of a fight trying to get past first class than Rhino did to try to get back in the ring, and there was no one holding him back. And uh, we knew something like this was going to happen. I mean, you could see over a mile away that Cardona was likely to get involved in this thing, and he did. And they go off the air. And the the one thing that did throw me through a loop was I thought Steph Delander. I didn't think they were going to go through the wedding, go through with the wedding, and I thought SDL was going to be in on it, which she's not. So she's just a baby face now. Zaya Brookside's her girl. Maybe they're going to team them up and they're going to win the knockouts tag titles. Who knows? Um, I'm a little tired this morning, folks, so this was not a strong review on my part, but um, I thought the episode was okay. It was, it was better than last week's. The wedding was entertaining. It was not the best piece of television I've seen in the world. It wasn't a top TNA wedding, you know, but uh, I thought it was fine. Um, what the hell's his name? AJ Francis. Oh, my God. Totally escaped me. AJ Francis saying that him and PCO 
had a classic assignment verse. It was absolutely laughable. That was by far my least favorite song. I mean, song uh, match on the card by freaking far. That's going to do it for me, guys. I will have more energy for you guys next week. I promise you. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode. We'll be back next week to talk some TNA. I think they're going to be in Tampa for the next. Yeah, because they're taping right now. Yes, so they'll be in Tampa, and we're going to see how that how that card is. They're doing Hammerstone versus Eric Young, so we're just getting, you know, the same shit over and over again. But it's uh, we'll see what they do. Hopefully, the production quality is a step up. I don't know. We'll see. But I will talk to you guys next week. I am out. I need to sleep.